Hey, do you guys enjoy driving through the countryside getting here? Driving through beautiful Poland and different things? You see the people out in their gardens? Did anybody see that? There's different people gardening right now. And uh, how many of you garden? Anybody here have a garden? Okay, some of you have a garden. Nice to raise your own veggies and things like that. I tried a garden a few years ago at my own house. It went horrible. <laughs> um, you know, I planted everything. I took care of everything. You know what the problem was? The soil was bad. I planted the garden where the soil was bad. And so I had to remove all of that soil and put in a compost mix and things like that. You know, the next year, things started to grow. And it was a whole lot better because I took the time to make the changes in the soil. And when I took the time to make the changes and I put in the effort to make the changes, all of a sudden things started to grow. And it was worth it. Do you know the same thing is true with church revitalization? Sometimes it just takes some changes. It takes putting in the effort takes a lot of hard work. And God can honor those things. And I know all of our gardens are different sizes. All of our churches are different sizes. And that's okay. It doesn't matter if you're in small church, big church, medium church. doesn't matter. We're all after the same thing. We're, off, we're after what David had talked about, having a healthy church. That's really what we want. And so whether your church is in decline right now, or whether it's plateaued, staying, or whether it's growing, there's all kinds of wonderful principles. And by the way, what David talked about, me being in the same church for 27 years, I've been in every single one of those areas multiple times. There's times in the church when I first came to the church as a young pastor, the church was in a serious, steep decline, okay? And then we went through plateau and we've grown and then decline. And so there's, I've been through this multiple, multiple times. I'm not an expert on church revitalization, but what I wanna do is I wanna share some very practical things that I have learned over 27 years of ministry. And these are things that by God's grace, I've been able to implement in our church and seen God use them in our church. And some of them culturally will work for you, maybe some of them won't, or you can take what you learned today and make it your own. And so that's my prayer for you. And like David said, my wife and I, when we were in seminary, we were in Dallas, um, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I got saved when I was 17, 18 years of age. I wasn't raised in a church, didn't have a clue. Uh, I did an internship at a church and that's kind of where I learned uh, about what it was to pastor and then I went to seminary. And so my wife and I prayed about two things. We prayed about, we wanted to go to a dead or dying church and see God resurrect it. And we wanted to go to one church for the rest of our lives. And so we've been there for 27 years. And, and we're thankful for what the Lord has done. Um, so that's where we are. Now, we're going to look at a lot of different passages. And I'm going to try to go quickly because I want to leave time for questions and answers at the end. Okay? And um, so if, if you have a question, write it down so, so you've got it. And what I want you also to do is I'm going to give you 12 points. That's a lot of points. But I want you to use that almost like a checklist. And you can think through on a scale of one to 10, how is my church doing in each of these points? Okay, maybe which one I'm doing well at, which one our church maybe needs to improve on. So what does it mean? Real hope and real help for every local church. Renewal is practical and possible. The first thing that I learned is that it takes a focus. It takes focus. You've gotta have the right focus. We need to have a renewed focus. Why? Because it's very easy for us to lose focus. And what kind of focus do we need? We need a Jesus kind of focus, okay? The focus Jesus had at the start of his ministry when he was speaking to Peter and Andrew by the sea. What did he say in Matthew 4? Follow me, he told them, I'm gonna make you fish for people. I'm gonna make you fishers of men. So it's right off the bat, it's all about catching people. Secondly, Jesus' focus in the middle of his ministry. When he was speaking to Zacchaeus, what did he say in Luke 19? The Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. So it was all about seeking the lost, all about saving the lost. How many of you, you guys have mushrooming, right? Mushering, they call it in Europe. Anybody do mushroom hunting? Yes, okay, so that's a big deal. There's festivals in Europe and stuff. Every springtime where I live, I love to run trails, and there'll be all these mushroom hunters out in the woods. But the time to do mushroom hunting is like two to three weeks. That's it, and then they're gone. I want you to understand, the window of opportunity to win people to Jesus Christ never closes. It never closes. It's always open season on the souls of men and women. 
Okay, the soul season never ends. Every day we can share the gospel. Any and every day we can reach out to people. So the focus on Jesus' ministry at the beginning was fishing. The focus of Jesus' ministry in the middle was what? Seeking and saving. You know what the focus at the end of his ministry was? The Great Commission, Matthew 28. Go therefore and make disciples. His focus never changed. Sometimes our churches lack revitalization because our churches lack focus. We've gotten away from the gospel ministry of seeing people saved. The, the words may change in Jesus' you know, vocabulary here. Fishing, seeking, saving, making. But the goal never changes. And by the way, even before his ascension, what did the Lord say in Acts chapter 1? You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So it's always the same. Beginning middle, end, and ongoing. Jesus never lost focus. Jesus doesn't want me to lose focus. He does not want you to lose focus. He does not want your church to lose focus. It's all about what? Catching people, seeking people, saving people, making disciples of people, witnessing further and farther to people. Guys, we have the gospel. We have the only hope in this world. This world is broken. People's lives are broken in sin. We have the hope of this world. And so the church has to constantly get back to the focus. And not only that, our own focus in our own lives. And it's easy to drift away from the focus. It's kind of like a boat that somebody tied to a dock, but then it got loose. Before they knew it, the tide takes it away, and the boat is way out of range. Some of our churches are like that. At one time, we were tied tight to the focus of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But we've started to drift, or our churches have started to drift away. Let, let me just ask you a question. What are some reasons churches lose the focus on the gospel? Let's just open it up. What are some reasons that you've seen? Like what kind of obstacles? Okay, problems, yes. We get all of a sudden in, in, inward focused, okay? Why else do we lose focus? Instead of focusing on the gospel, what happens to our churches? Why do we lose focus? What else? Comfortable Just getting comfortable, okay? I think leadership is the key. Also, everything rises and falls on leadership. If the leaders are not focused on the gospel, the church is not going to be focused on the gospel. And so to me, that's very important that me as a pastor, I need to be focused on the mission. I need to be sharing the gospel. I need to be sharing my faith. I have to be living this out. I sat next to a plane on a, um, her name was um, Mona Meyer. She's from Germany. She runs for the, for the national team in Germany, young lady. Man, she heard the gospel sitting next to me for eight and a half hours, let me tell you. I, I had the same taxi driver, a woman at a hotel in Krakow. I came in a couple days early, and she took me to different places. Let me tell you, uh, her name was Aga. She heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I tipped very well because I don't want to be a cheap Christian, and I want to leave a good testimony. Live out your faith. Live out your faith. One of the things that I do as a pastor in preaching I will share stories as I'm preaching as they fit into the message. And I'll let people know, hey, I shared the gospel this past week. I'll let people know, hey, this is a person I witnessed to. Would you pray for them? And I'll just give their first name. And so cast that vision. If you're in a position of leadership in your church, let them know you're living out the gospel ministry. Real hope and help for every local church. Renewal is practical and possible. What else does it take? It takes faith. Do you believe that God can still save people? Okay, one person does. So glad. <laughs> Do you believe God can still save people? Yes. yes. Okay, well, let's, let's live out that faith. I, I meet with a guy named Tim every single Tuesday. He's a brand new believer in our church, just came to faith. I love meeting with new Christians. I'm discipling him. We go through a Bible study early, Tuesday morning, 630. There's nothing better than discipling new believers. They don't have a clue. They, they don't know where anything is in the Bible. They don't know how to pray. It's so refreshing. It's awesome. Ask God to give you a new believer to disciple. And ask God to give you somebody to lead to Christ. Uh, we're just, I mean, we just had our first transgender person come to faith in Jesus Christ not too long ago. I mean, 
God is still saving people, friends. The world is confused. They have no clue. We have the truth. So we need to stop doubting that people can come to faith. And the last that I remember, the gospel still changes lives, okay? And the good news is just as powerful today as it was 2,000 years ago. Romans chapter 1, I'm obligated both to Greeks and barbarians, both to the wise and foolish, so I'm eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God to salvation. To everyone, how many? Everyone who believes, for the Jew, for, uh, for, first to the Jew and also to the Greek. So the power of the first century church is the same power we have, all right? So pastors and ministry leaders, we've got to believe in the power. You know, by the way, when I first came to the church 27 years ago, I had an older man in the church who was very evangelistic, always sharing his faith, loved to go visit people. And he came up to me so discouraged. He said, Pastor Scott, he said, the previous pastor here, he said, this church will never grow. He said, it's too hard an area. Let me tell you something. Our church has grown. The leaders have to lead the way. We've got to be the ones that share the faith, friends. So we've got to have renewed confidence. What did Jesus say in Matthew 16? I will build my church and the gates of Hades, the gates of hell will not overpower it. So, hey, listen, you're a part of something so powerful, it's never going to be defeated. And you're a part of something so important, it's never going to fail. That was Jesus' promise to you about his church. You're a part of something so powerful, it will never be defeated. And something so important, it's never going to fail. And this was God's plan. This is God's plan to take the gospel. There is no plan B. There's only plan A. This is it. And plan A works. And you may say, it's so daunting a task. You know, Matthew 18, the great commission, go into all the nations. Look who's here today. Look around. Look at all the nations that are represented here. The gospel is powerful, isn't it? God is saving people from every land. It's just awesome is really what it is. And by the way, it's not all on you. John chapter 6, 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. So who's doing the work? God the Father. God the Father is drawing the people. We're just getting in line with what the Lord is already doing. So don't fear, don't be overwhelmed when it comes and, and encouraging your church to do this as well. And don't forget the book ends of the Great Commission. What are the bookends, both ends? Matthew 28, 18, and then all the way through 20, what does he say? All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So guess what you have? You have absolute authority. Rely on it. And then, and remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. You have personal presence. Realize it. Get that. You have the absolute authority of God behind you. You rely on the absolute authority of Jesus. And you also have his personal presence. Realize his presence is with you. You are not alone. So be bold and be aggressive. You have Jesus' authority backing you, and you have Jesus' presence with you. Think about that. Your church and who you are in your church and what God can do with you and your church. So it's going to take focus revitalization. I believe it's going to take faith that God is still working. And it's going to take fortitude. What is fortitude? Hard work. It's going to take hard work. Renewal, church renewal, church growth, reaching people, real, uh, revitalization. It doesn't just happen. It takes a lot of hard work. You know, COVID revealed a lot of things about a lot of people. One of them is the laziness of our people trying to get them back to church, get them back to serve. They got comfortable online. Oh, man, so frustrating. You know what it revealed? It didn't just reveal lazy uh, people. It also revealed a lot of lazy pastors. There are plenty of churches that just decided to sit back, and their pastors thought, I don't have to work as hard anymore, and I can just take it easy like my people are taking it easy. By the way, those kind of pastors are losing people from their churches. And they're going into other churches like my church and your church. So we've got to be careful not to be lazy. It's called spiritual atrophy. Atrophy meaning weakness or degeneration. Uh, there's a boxer who lived in the 1960s and, or boxed in the 1960s and 19, uh, or in the 1970s. His name was Joe Frazier, a great boxer. This is what he said. Champions aren't made in the ring. They're merely recognized there. 
What you cheat on in the early light of morning will show up in the ring under the bright lights. If you're not a, war a hard worker, it's going to show up in your ministry. You and I have to be hard workers or we're going to get knocked out of ministry. So what do we need to work hard at? Let me give you a couple things. Work hard as a pastor ministry leader at planning. How many of you like to fish? Ever go fishing? Any fishers here? Okay, you guys like to fish. You go on a fishing trip. Well, you got to plan your fishing trip. Okay, where am I going? What tackle or equipment do I have? What hooks, what lines, what sinkers, what floats, what rods, what reels, what bait, what lures, what spears, gaffs, traps, waders, tackle box? You go on a fishing trip, you got to know what, you're, what kind of equipment you need. If you're fishing for people, you need to be organized as a church. You maybe get together with visionary leaders in your church. What can we do in our community? What can we do where our church is situated? How can we reach this people? How can we reach the town we're in? Um, get your calendar out. Look at the calendar and say, well, what kind of outreach events could we have? Or what kind of sermon series could I preach that we could use as an outreach? Or, or whatever it is. What could we teach on? How could we reach neighborhoods and canvas them and go door to door if you can do that in your area? Or visitation or youth sports or training your people in evangelism. You know, thinking through what can we do, being, being very diligent in that. Proverbs 21.5, the plans of the diligent certainly lead to what? Profit. They make a difference. Anyone who is reckless certainly becomes poor. We've got a lot of reckless churches out there that just think their church is automatically going to grow. But they're not taking the time and they're not organized and there's not leadership in place to really prayerfully think about what they should be doing. So work hard at planning and work hard persistently. 2 Timothy 4, 5, do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. What did he call evangelism? Work. It means it's hard. It's hard work. Luke chapter 14. Master told the servant, go out into the highways, hedges, make them come in so that my house may be filled. Okay, focus, faith, fortitude. Here's something else it takes. I believe it takes money. It takes funds. In other words, what do you mean? If you want to see church revitalization happen, put your money where your mouth is. That's what we've got to tell our leaders, okay? If outreach and evangelism is going to be a priority in your church, outreach and evangelism needs to be a priority in your budget. Does the budget of your church, does it reflect the priority of outreach and evangelism? Does it? That's a question you have to ask. What percentage of your budget, budget goes to your church reaching people for Jesus Christ or revitalization? What percent goes to missions outside of your church? You know, think about that. What, what, what money are you putting toward training your people in evangelism or funding key ministries to, to reach people? Youth ministry, is it reaching people or some kind of adult ministry or sports ministry? I don't know what ministries you need in your church that God could use, but maybe you need to talk to your leadership about funding some ministries. And then I would encourage you to support evangelism even outside your church. One of the things we do as a church is we basically give a tithe. Just about 10% of anything that comes into our church, we give out. So we support missionaries. We support missions organizations, parachurch things. Why would we do that? Because we believe God blesses generosity. That's why. So I would encourage you to be a generous church and really give to other ministries that are doing things for Jesus Christ. Um, and I would encourage you, listen, you who are, how many of you are senior pastors here, preaching pastors, okay? Please preach on giving. Do not be afraid to preach on giving. I'm amazed at the pastors who won't preach on giving. God's people need to know to give. God, giving is all over the scriptures, the importance of generosity. And I'm not going to preach a whole message here on giving, but you guys know the verses to give first and give your best and to give out of poverty. I mean, you, you see that in the, the widow at the temple? You see that with the Macedonian believers in 2 Corinthians? They gave out of their great poverty um, to give joyfully and generously in 2 Corinthians? And by the way, I want to say this to you guys that are in ministry. Don't be cheap. You need to be givers. If you expect your people to give and you're not giving, you're doing your people a disservice. And so you need to get in the regular habit of giving to God in your church. 
I was something my wife and I, the day, day one when we went into ministry, we decided that we were, we were going to double tithe. We just decided that. If I'm going to be in leadership, we will give twice as much as what most people in our church will give. God has honored that, guys. And I would encourage you before the Lord, you think through what the Lord would want you to do and give generously to the Lord. And God's people have always supported God's work. Luke chapter 8. Afterwards, he was traveling from one town and village to another, preaching and telling the good news of the kingdom. The 12 were with him and many others who were supporting them from their possessions. God's people have always supported God's ministry. So real help for every local church. What does it take? Focus, faith, fortitude, funds. I believe this is so important. It takes freedom. What do I mean by that? What we would call in America legalism, freedom from legalism or freedom from Phariseeism. Think about the Pharisees in the New Testament, how they were completely holding on and latching on to rules and regulations and traditions that were not found in the scripture. We have churches doing the same thing today. And do you know what legalism or Phariseeism is in our church? It's a noose around the neck. It completely strangles the life out of a church, holding on to traditions that are not biblical and putting them on the same level as biblical truth, maintaining preferences that give a false sense of spirituality, whether it's the way someone dresses when they come into church, thinking they have to have a suit and tie on. Where's that in the Bible? Uh, whether it's musical instruments. We only sing the old songs in our church. Do you realize eight or nine different times in the Bible, it says sing a new song, sing a new song, sing a new song. One day I got up with our people and I told them, I said, do you realize all these passages on sing a new song, sing a new song, sing a new song? Do you realize if we're not singing a new song, we're in sin as a church? We are? Yeah, because those are commands in scripture to sing a new song. It's okay to sing old songs too. So sometimes we get so bound by traditions, whether it's instruments, whether it's songs, whether it's dress. And what we're doing is we're choking the life out of the church because we put these traditions on the same level as the Bible. And that's not worth there to be. And you may be saying, well, what's that thing you're looking at up there? Oh, we'll, we'll talk about that's up too early. Go ahead and take that down, Fred. Okay. So churches need to be very careful not to act like Pharisees with their thousands of extra rules in the Mishnah, okay? Legalism, again, is that noose around the neck. This is one of the things that I did when I became a pastor at the church. I systematically set out to remove every single one of those legalistic things. They didn't all happen overnight, and that would not have been a wise thing to do. I would have destroyed the church if I tried to make every change immediately. And that's a mistake a lot of pastors make. You have to be very patient, like, like David was mentioning earlier. And so over 27 years of ministry, we've changed things in our church that were hindering the growth of the church. Have you ever walked into a stuffy room? It's real hot, it's real humid, and it's like, you just want out of that room? There's churches that are very stuffy. You walk into this stuffy, legalistic, oppressive, tradition-bound church, and you don't want to stay in that church. Where do you want to go? You want to go to a church where you can breathe and where there's fresh air. Removing those legalistic things and staying focused on the Bible brings that fresh air. Years ago, I planted a shrub called a Rose of Sharon. And it was a great plant and was planted in the right spot with the right soil, with the right amount of water, with the right amount of sun and everything, and it died. Why did it die? Here's the picture of it. It's called root strangulation. That's why it died. The roots never spread out. They just kept wrapping themselves around, growing in a circle. This is what happens to many established churches. They, they die of root strangulation. Kind of what you were saying about earlier, our Polish friend back there. You know, it's all about us. It's the inner focus. It's, it's, they don't spread out. They're holding on fiercely to their traditions. They're bound by their rules and their regulations. I want to encourage you to be very careful in your churches about root strangulation. Jesus taught the religious leaders, be very careful not to teach your preferences as doctrine. 
Mark chapter 7. He answered, Isaiah prophesied about, uh, correctly about you hypocrites, as it is written. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. They worship me in vain, teaching as doctrine human commands. Abandoning the command of God, you hold on to human tradition. That's the danger. Holding on to our traditions more than the Bible or on the same level on the Bible. Always prioritize the word of God over your traditions. Please understand this. I tell young pastors, don't preach your preferences. Preach God's word. God doesn't bless your preferences. He blesses the preaching of his word. And so make sure you're preaching the doctrines of his word, not what you like or don't like. Preach his word. And by the way, if we preach and teach preferences, it produces that pharisaical judgmentalism. We start looking down our noses at other people. The other thing it does is it breeds Christians who stifle the joy in a church. And the other thing it does, if we preach our traditions and our preferences, it confuses our kids. It confuses the younger generation about really what is godliness and what is not. So I would just want to encourage you, make the necessary changes in your church. I know it's hard. It also takes a lot of prayer and the right timing and talking to other people. But sometimes if we don't change, we're going to die. And if our churches don't change, they're going to die. You've heard it said, the seven last words of a dying church, we never did it that way before. Oh, we never did it that way before, Pastor. We never did it that way before. We never did it that way. Understand something. Uh, we have a saying in America, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Do you guys know that saying? Maybe you have it too. Can't teach an old dog new tricks. Here's the good news. You're not a dog. You can learn. You can learn. Hey, let me tell you something. This old dog, I learned a lot of new tricks through COVID. I had to get out of my comfort zone. When we went to online ministries, we had to set up things for cameras and set up things for monitors, and I had to record a sermon ahead of time. I was like, I had to, I had to be flexible and change. So we can learn new things. But I would encourage you, before you make changes, always ask, why did we do it this way? Or why did they do it this way? You want to be very sensitive to any changes you make in the church. For instance, you come into an old established church and there's this huge wooden pulpit that's like 10 foot long by 6 foot high. All right? And you're like, you know, I want to get rid of that pulpit. I'd, I'd like to have something smaller so that I can come around and interact with the people and feel like I'm closer to the people. And one Sunday you just get rid of that pulpit. And then you find out so-and-so's great-grandfather made that from an oak tree in the old church by hand. You're in trouble is what you are. Okay, so maybe the best thing could have been, hey, I'm thinking about removing that pulpit. Would you guys be okay with that? No! <gasps> but at least you've asked the question, and then maybe you think through how to make that transition. Maybe you use the pulpit down front as the communion table so you still keep it there. So you think through ways to do it. Just don't make the change without thinking and asking and prayerfully working through it. Um, something very important that Paul said that is very applicational to churches and us individually. What I want to do is I want to free you up to be creative in your church, okay? And a phrase that I like to use is this. Think outside the box but inside the Bible. That means think outside the box. Be creative. What can you do differently to reach people? It's okay. Think outside the box, but always inside the Bible. So I'm not going to go against Scripture. The Bible is my foundation. And so I'm going to teach and preach. But if the Bible is silent on this and the Bible gives me freedom on this, it's okay. It's all right to be creative. What did Paul say in 1 Corinthians 9? He said, although I'm free from all and not anyone's slave, I've made myself a slave to everyone in order to win more people. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win Jews. To those under the law as one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, to win those who are under the law. To those without the law, like one without the law, though I'm not without God's law, but under the law of Christ, 
to win those without the law. To the weak, I became weak in order to win the weak. Weak of conscience is what he's talking about there, you know, not taking the meat at the uh, sacrifice at the temple. I've become all things to all people so that I may by every possible means save some. He said, I'm going to do whatever it takes to win people to Jesus Christ. And I'm going to be creative about it. Do you realize he said, I'm going to win, 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 win four times. And then he said, I want to save them. Save defines what he meant by win. So to the Jews, I'm going to act like a Jew. To the Gentiles, I'm going to act like a Gentile. So what is the context where your church is? How can you reach the people without sinning, but being creative, thinking outside the box? I want to free you up to say, to, to brainstorm and to pray, to get with your leaders and say, how can God use us to reach this city? How can God use us to reach this town? How can God use us to reach the people around us? Get creative with it. Kind of like David mentioned earlier, was it Lithuania you talked about years ago? Some guy would go out with a guitar and lead him through. Think of something fun and creative that's outside the box, but always inside the Bible. I want to give you a great example. This is a picture of a man you probably don't know who that is. Hudson Taylor, missionary from England in his young days. He went to China and he changed China. This is Hudson Taylor. Listen carefully. He did not change China like that. Here's Hudson Taylor, the missionary. A little bit different. Do you know what Hudson Taylor did? He became Chinese. He became Chinese to reach the Chinese. He dressed as a Chinaman, grew a pigtail, learned the Chinese language, ate Chinese food, refused British military protection, and chose Chinese housing instead. Oh, and by the way, how did that go over in England? He was horribly criticized. He was made fun of for doing that. Talk about a guy who thought outside the box, though, but inside the Bible. And by the way, when Hudson Taylor died, 18,000 converts were traced to his China Inland Mission. 300 stations of work, 20 in unevangelized areas, 700 Chinese workers taking the gospel, 125 schools were started, 849 missionaries in all 18 provinces, up from a few dozen, and the underground church in China is thriving today. That can happen when we think outside the box, but inside the Bible. So get creative and get excited about how God can use you in the context and the ministries where you live and be willing to change in order to reach people. Be willing to, to see our churches change in order to reach uh, people. And until we change, our churches won't change. We need to have the right attitude as well. And so what can you do to change? Maybe it's as simple as changing service times or service days. Maybe, maybe it's changing outreach ideas. Maybe it's eliminated programs. Maybe you've been doing the same old programs in your church for 20, 30, 50 years, and they're doing nothing. You've got to kill that program and start something new. Bob Beal, who's been a speaker here at ELF, um, he said something fascinating. He said, how do you revive a business or a church in nine months? And this is what he said. You want to revive a business or revive a church in nine months? Hire someone, fire someone, and kill a sacred cow. <laughs> kill an old tradition, is what he said. Bring somebody else new, get rid of somebody else in some leadership position that's not doing the job, and get rid of something in your church that hasn't been working. Whether it's a children's ministry or some other ministry, hire one, fire one, and kill a sacred cow. What's going to happen when you kill a sacred cow? Oh boy, there's going to be people that will be mad at you. So you've got to be very careful thinking through, but this is all about setting the stage for God to work. How bad do you want revitalization to happen in your ministry? How bad do you want it to happen in your church? Here's the next one. Focus, faith, fortitude, funds, freedom. It takes fearlessness. Why? Because it's hard to make changes. That's why. And some of you, even as you've been sitting here, you're starting to think through changes that need to be made in your church. And you're thinking, yeah, we need to do this differently. We need to change that. We need to start this. Mark Twain, a humorist in America, said, the only person who likes change is a wet baby. The only one who likes change is that baby who needs its diaper changed. Understand that. When you make changes, and I've seen this through 27 years of ministry, 
man, have I been criticized. I have been slandered. I have been gossiped about on social media. I have received so many emails of hatred, spit at me, venom. Um, it's amazing. I've had my spirituality questioned. And you need to understand the changes we've made have been very prayerful, very deliberate, but very patient. I'm, I'm not a rogue pastor. I'm not one of these pastors that say, well, I'm going to just change everything. I work with a team. I have an elder uh, group of four or five other elders, and we work together. And so I'm a very impatient person personally, but I'm a very patient person in ministry. Do you know why? Because the church is not my church. It's Jesus' church. But you need to understand what's going to happen when you make changes. People are not going to ha be happy. Uh, Jim Lytle, he's a college seminary professor in America. There is no job quite like the pastorate where you can displease so many of God's people while pleasing Him, while pleasing God. And that's the truth. So what do we need to do? Not live in the fear of people. Proverbs 29, 25. The fear of mankind is a snare. It's a trap when we start living in the fear of people. But the one who trusts the Lord is protected or is exalted. So if you're a pastor or a ministry leader and you're always fearing the people, you fear the deacons, you fear the elders. You, feel, you fear that family. Uh, David Brown talked earlier about the dynasty that's in the established churches or the dynasty. You say it so much better than Americans. <laughs> you know, think about those well-established church families. There's a, there can be a fear there. You've got you to think through, do I fear God or do I fear man? I need to do what is right. But we do need to ask, what will someone think? What will someone say? But really, the most important question is, what does God think? What does God think? What does God say about this? We live in the fear of God, not of man. Let me just ask you, what are some reasons why we fear people as ministry leaders? What are some of the reasons? What are some of the reasons we fall in that trap? Anybody? Fear. What is it? Fear. Yeah. What about it, though? Why, why do we fear? We want to be liked. Okay, we want everybody to like us. I do. I want everybody to like me. I want all of you to like me. And we want us to like each other. It's just part of our human nature, right? Why else do we fear? Changes. We fear changes and the consequences that might come, right? <laughs> Criticism comes, for sure. Yeah. Losing control. Losing control. Yeah, it's a good one. Losing the power. Anyway. Yeah, losing the power, the control, yep. Losing money. Losing money. Families will leave the church. Uh-oh. Losing attendance. Uh-oh. Let me tell you, every change we've made, there's every change we've made in our church, we've lost people, but more people have come in because the change was made. Every single time. I kid you not. So you have to weigh out the balance. All right, let's go on. Uh, don't fear criticism. What was, I just want to give you this in 2 Corinthians 10.10. Look at Paul. <laughs> Look at poor Paul. This is what was said about him. It was said, his letters are weighty and powerful. His physical presence is weak. His public speaking amounts to nothing. Do you realize that? They criticized his writing. It's weighty. They criticized the way he looked. They criticized his preaching. You're in leadership. Anybody in leadership will be criticized. You will be criticized what you wrote. You will be criticized by how you look, the clothes you wore, the way your hair is. There's people sitting out there on Sunday criticizing you. Think about that. They're going to criticize what you said. Oh, I've got plenty of letters. I'm sure you too. When you come after you preach on a Sunday and there's this big, thick envelope waiting for you, and it's not cash. It's not money, friends. <laughs> it's a four to five page, you know, criticism of, of really what it is. You didn't go into ministry expecting not to be criticized, I hope. Criticism comes with leadership. If you're going to serve Jesus, you're going to be criticized. It just comes with the territory. But don't let fear keep you from being a risk taker. Leaders need to lead, so lead. And, and don't fear 
the attacks. Fear God. 2 Timothy 1.7, God's not given us a spirit of fear, right? Power, love, and a sound judgment. All right, let's go on. Next one. This is so important. It takes feeding. They're all important. What do I mean by feeding? What's the best restaurant in town that you like to go to where you live? Just name one. Anybody? Steakhouse. You got a steakhouse you like to go to? What else? Anybody else? Bastard. Okay. There's, there's restaurants. Guess what? Is, is there ever a lack of people at those good restaurants? No. No. There's a line to get into them. And by the way, when you go to that good restaurant, what, what do you then do? You tell your friends about your restaurant that you've gone to. You tell your family about it. The same thing happens with your church and your ministry. When you feed God's people well, when you feed the sheep week in and week out, and they are well fed, they tell other people, you need to come to our church. You need to hear our pastor. You need to come here. Your soul is going to be fed. Hey, this is, this is good stuff. That's what they're going to tell you. So what I want to encourage you to do is work hard at preaching and teaching. Work very hard at preaching and teaching. What does it mean? No leftover meals. No microwave Saturday night meals. Put in the work all week long, studying hard. Cook up fresh messages, fresh sermons, fresh lessons every single week. Feed those sheep well. And by the way, people now check us online first, just like David had said. I'm amazed at the people that come to our church, and I meet them after the service, and, and I go up and I, I hang out in a, a welcome area, and, um, and I say, hey, how long have you been coming to church? This is our first time, Pastor Scott, but we've been coming to your church for three weeks online. We've been coming for six weeks online. That blows me away. I, I'm that's so many people. And so feed them well. Feed them well. I got, a, I got a nice email just this past week from a guy who's brand new to the church. And this is what he said. I'm not going to read the whole thing. He had just talked about how his 15-year-old son felt fed and that he wanted to come back and that he was excited. You get a 15-year-old kid wanting to come to church, that's a win, right? That, that was a win for me. So just in, I was very encouraged by this guy's email. Uh, some of my study habits, I just want to encourage you, get on your knees and pray. Start your study time on God's knees and pray. Ask for God's message for his people, but he's got to give the message to me first and to you first. God, this, this has to apply to me first before I can feed your people. Um, spend time in prayer. I spent time on the seventh floor before, the, uh, before Elf started. I just spent time up there in prayer. And honestly, I got down on the floor up there and I just prayed. And I prayed for the sessions. And I prayed for the messages. And I prayed for you. And spend time in prayer for your people, the people that you'll be talking to. Uh, give the time that's needed. 2 Timothy 2. Be diligent to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who doesn't need to be ashamed, correctly teaching the word of truth. 2 Timothy chapter 4. I solemnly charge you before God in Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead, because of his appearing in his kingdom. Look at verse 2. Preach the word, not preach your preferences. Not preach your traditions. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season, whether it's a good week or not, whether you feel like preaching or not. Correct, rebuke, encourage, great patience, and teaching. I like those five ingredients. Because once in a while, I'll have somebody come up to me after a sermon and say, well, Pastor Scott, that sermon was really harsh. And I'll say, you know what? I want to take you to this passage that talks about God telling me how I'm supposed to preach. And sometimes I'm called to step on toes, and that's okay. It says I need to correct people at times and rebuke them and encourage them and show great patience and also teach them. So don't just tell them what they're doing wrong, but also tell them, teach them how to do it right. So just the encouragement with God's word there. All right, let's go on to the next one. It takes faithfulness. What, is it, what do I mean by that? A close walk with Jesus yourself. Just have a close personal walk that's authentic. A man of integrity, a woman of integrity. Um, I lost three pastor friends this past year to ministry. Three of my friends are no longer in ministry. Three in one year's time for different reasons. That's sad and that hurts. I don't want to be number four. I don't want you guys to be number four. 
And so we've got to make sure we're very careful with our own walks. 1 Corinthians 11, imitate me as I also imitate Christ. And I think it's good to periodically review the qualifications of a pastor in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Um, and just be careful. Make sure we're accountable and we're in a good spiritual routine. And uh, be careful with our families as well. Uh, many a man has ruined his ministry with a ruined marriage. And so we've got to be careful about our marriages to be the husbands we need to be and the dads that we need to be as well. Uh, number nine, it takes felligation. And you may say, felligation, that's not a word. I know it's not. I made it up. It means the faith to delegate. It takes delegation, but the faith in people to delegate, to believe in others, to trust others, to empower others. Listen, your church can't be revitalized if you want control over everything at all times. You have to be willing to delegate to other people. Here's a picture. You don't want to be this guy. He's the one-man band. He plays every instrument in the church. He does everything in the church, okay? He does it all, decides it all, controls it all, micromanages it all, all right? And I did a three-and-a-half-hour, four-part pre-forum session yesterday. A couple of you guys were here for that. Who was here for that yesterday? You were? You guys were. So... Um, if you want to listen to it, you can go on Elf. It's three and a half hours long. We go through the life of Jethro and Moses, and we dive into everything leadership, all right, and what good leadership looks like and the lessons that we can learn. So it's just so important to delegate. Delegate to the right people with the right giftedness. And these are some of the things we use in our church, especially with key leadership. The people we choose to delegate to, they need to have character, meaning they're godly. There's chemistry meaning they're a great fit with the team. There's competency, meaning they're gifted. They have the gifts to handle it. There's capacity, meaning there's growth potential to keep growing in that area. And then there's communication. They're good with people and they communicate well. Those are just some of the areas and there's others as well. But recruit people and train people and empower people. And, um, and there's different ways you can do that. I can't go into all of that, but you can, they can shadow you. You can mentor them, meet with people every week. We do a spiritual gift survey in our church to help people. And I would encourage you to do this. And if you're in a smaller church, you can do this with everybody in your church. There's different spiritual gift surveys online. Uh, from time to time, I'll mention it from the pulpit, encouraging people to serve. Because if, you're, if you want to encourage people to serve, but they don't know how to serve, where to serve, they don't know their spiritual gifts, well, we need to equip them. And so we say, go to this spiritual gift survey, take it online. It's 10 to 15 minutes long. They can fill out the questions. And then my wife, who is our volunteer coordinator, contacts them after they fill it out because she gets an email that someone's uh, filled it out. And then she sets up an appointment with them and says, it looks like this is your spiritual gift. And these, what are your interests? And these are the ministries in our church you could serve in. And so we have it organized so we can help people know where they should be serving. Instead of having somebody who will just serve there, we'll just do that. But they're not gifted for it. So they're not going to feel it's the right thing. And the ministry is not going to benefit because they're doing the wrong thing. So try to get the right people in the right place. Ephesians 4 to 11, he himself gave some as apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers to equip who? The saints for the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ. And so God's people are to do the work of ministry. You guys know that. I'm not supposed to do everything in the church. You're not supposed to do everything in the church. We need to entrust the people. We need to empower the people. We need to recruit the people. We need to train the people is what we need to do. And if we don't, we're going to lose people. Bad leaders will always lose good leaders. Please understand that. Bad leaders will always lose good leaders. You, you, may be, you may be a five or six on a scale of one to 10 as a leader, and you have somebody in your church who's an eight or nine. They're just a really good leader. They're not gonna stay under your leadership. If you don't empower them and trust them, they're gonna go to another church where they're empowered and entrusted and can use their gifts. So grow as a leader and, and just be careful in that area. Um, Exodus 18, this is what Jethro, the father-in-law, tells Moses. What you're doing is not good. What wasn't good? Remember, 
all day long, all morning long. He's judging the people. He's tired. The people are tired. And Moses' father-in-law said to him, you're certainly going to wear out both yourself and these people who are with you because the task is too heavy for you. You can't do it alone. And what would he tell him? Divide and conquer. Recruit people to oversee thousands and hundreds and fifties and tens. Get organized in your church. Get structure and systems in place in your church. Really break it down. That's how growth and revitalization can take place as well as you recruit and train more people. So think through that whole area of delegation. Here's our next one. I believe it takes fellowship. And what is that? Well, you know the words, community, connection, care, that sincere, loving, nurturing atmosphere in a church. Acts chapter 2, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, the breaking of bread, to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, many wonders, signs being performed through the apostles. And all the believers were together, held all things in common. They sold their possessions, property, distributed the needs to all as any had need. It was just a beautiful fellowship of believers. John 13, I give you a new commandment. Love one another just as I've loved you. You also love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. A loving church is a powerful church. And a loving church is a very attractive church as well. And who needs to model this? You do. Who needs to model this? I do. We set the standard. Everything rises and falls on leadership. If we are cold and we are uncaring, what do you think the congregation is going to be? The same. The church oftentimes takes on the personality of the pastor. You may have heard that true too. And it's true. And so you and I need to make sure we are living these truths out in our lives. That's why 1 Timothy chapter 3, we read earlier, one of the requirements for a pastor is hospitality. Sometimes we think, well, that's a woman's job. No, 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 no. That friendliness, that welcoming, that, that care, that's one of the requirements of being in ministry listed out in the qualifications. And so maybe that's one you and I need to work on. Uh, there was an atmosphere of joy and praise in Acts chapter 2 again. Every day devoted themselves, meaning they ate their food, joyful, sincere hearts, praising God that was just a part of their church. Um, do people enjoy coming to your church? Sincerely. Do, do people enjoy being a part of it? That's a question you have to ask. Um, one of the things I say to the people in, in the church where I pastor, I tell them quite often, especially the new ones. I say, we love to have fun at our church. We're very serious about our faith, but there's nothing wrong with laughter. And so I let them know that. It's okay to laugh in our church. It's okay to have joy in our church. So rejoice, Philippians 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I'll say it, rejoice. Nehemiah, don't grieve because the joy of the Lord is your strength. Here's number 11, we're almost done. It takes first rate. What do I mean by that? Do ministry with excellence. Just do ministry with excellence, whatever that ministry is. Uh, we're not going to be here for long. Ecclesiastes 9.10. Whatever your hands find to do, do with all your strength, because there's no work planning, knowledge, or wisdom in Sheol, the grave where you are going. Do ministry with excellence, whatever you do. God deserves our best. Colossians 3. Whatever you do in word or deed and everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Colossians 3, 23 and 4. Whatever you do, do it from your heart as something done for the Lord and not for people, knowing that you will receive the reward of an inheritance from the Lord. You serve the Lord Christ. 1 Corinthians 10, whatever you eat, whether, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. Do everything with excellence. 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 talks about excel still more, do even more. So let me ask you a question. Are you excelling in your preaching? Are you excelling in your teaching? Are you excelling in your administration and leadership? Elf does an amazing job. I'm blown away by the administration and organization of this place and everything going on. Just looking at the app, I'm like, that's crazy. Um, you know, do you excel in communication? Returning emails on time, showing up to things on time, updating your website. If I went to your website, would I see something on the calendar from three years ago? 
Kind of like opening a refrigerator and seeing something that's so old and bad. Are things up to date? Do you think do things with excellence? Online and streaming and first impressions, facilities and grounds. And you may say, well, those things aren't really important. The gospel's important. Well, well let me ask you this. Back to the restaurant illustration. Would you go to a restaurant that had mold on a table? Or you go into the bathroom, it's really disgusting? I don't think you'd probably go back there, right? Why would somebody come back to your church? Why would they if it's not excellent, if it's not clean? Just cleaned. It doesn't have to have everything pristine and beautiful, but just done well. So I would encourage you to go back to your ministries and churches and think, how could we do things better here? Not just ministry of the preaching of the word, but also even our facilities. How could we make this place look better for the glory of God? First Chronicles chapter 29, David's preparation for the temple that Solomon was going to build. So to the best of my ability, I've made provision for the house of my God. He did the best that he could. And here's the last one, and probably one of the most important. If you're going to see your church revitalized, it's going to take fervency. What is that? It's going to take prayer. You're going to have to be fervent before God in prayer, to be on our knees, because all of our man-made efforts come up to nothing unless God is in it. True? Nothing's going to happen unless God is in it. And so be a man, be a woman of prayer. I, I like this saying, work like everything depends on you. Pray like everything depends on God. Work like everything depends on you. And pray like everything depends on God. James chapter 5. The prayer of a righteous person is very powerful in its effect. Elijah was a human being as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain for three years and six months. It did not rain on the land. Then he prayed again, and the sky gave rain. And the land produced its fruit. It says he was a human just like us. He had the same nature just like us. If you want to accomplish much, we must be much in prayer. Fervent prayer and earnest prayer. And so pray. So what are you praying for? What are you praying about for your church? Are you praying for souls? God, I want to see someone saved. God, I want to see people come to faith. God, I want to see families come into our church. God, I want to see our church grow. God, would you help me make these changes that I know that need to take place? Would you line those up with the right timing and the right support and the people? God, would you, would you help me my preaching and my teaching? Give utterance with my applications, my illustrations, understanding the passage. Pray about your preaching. Pray for a boldness. A, 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 just a Boldness in sharing the gospel. A boldness was what the Lord wants you to do. You know, Ephesians chapter 6. Pray also for me, Paul said, that message may be given when I open my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. Pray that I might be bold enough to speak about what I should. Why would Paul pray for boldness twice? Do you know why? Because he was afraid. Because he lacked boldness just like you do and just like I do at times. And so he said, would you pray for me to be bold? Because sometimes I'm not bold and I know that I need to be. Maybe you need to pray for unity in your church. There's a struggle there that's happening. Maybe you need to just pray for wisdom, pray for God's will, pray for protection, pray for fruitfulness. Pray, just pray and keep praying and keep seeking the Lord. And I end with this quote by Samuel Chadwick. Satan dreads nothing but prayer. His one concern is to keep the saints from praying. He fears nothing from prayerless studies, prayerless work, prayerless religion. He laughs at our toil, mocks at our wisdom, mocks our wisdom, but he trembles when we pray. And so let's be a praying people. And that's real hope and help for every local church. Renewal is practical and possible. Focus, great commission. Faith, believe God can still save. Fortitude, work hard. Funds, money. Freedom, freedom from religion not bound by tradition or preferences. Fearlessness, don't live in the fear of man. Feeding, preach and teach the sheep well. Faithfulness, leaders need to lead the way, be a man or woman of integrity. Felegation, the faith to delegate and power and trust and raise up other leaders around you. Fellowship, love and care for people. First rate, do ministry with excellence and fervency. Let's be people of prayer.